just stay behind me as I'm looking. You know this? Okay. Let me just. So uh, you on my. That is. Look how beautiful it is. Can you look down and see that? I just look how it reflects on it. Oh. You are. I go to the door, I open the door, and there's Michael Jackson. And so he says, hi, I'm Michael Jackson. And we all start laughing because, oh, really? Yeah, that is Michael Jackson. We have this booming sound system. You usually have a DJ on cover shoots or some kind of music going, so that's not unusual. What was unusual to me is they played almost all Michael Jackson songs. And he goes on this huge platform and immediately starts doing freeze frames of his most famous dance moves. I half expected him to bust into a move because he would just, he would just start. All of a sudden, I go, this is it, this is it. <laughs> He's getting ready to move. But he wouldn't exactly do the whole thing, but he was enjoying it. I walked over to, to speak to him to just check to see how he was doing. And he says to me, are you getting what you need? He wanted to make sure that Ebony was getting the shot that we wanted. Um, to really... Go to the root of it. I think you would have to start, so I would say, when I was, I think I was eight years old, Sammy Davis Jr. introduced me to Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget it. And that I heard him say something like that, and I, and I just tucked it away subconsciously mm -hmm. and never mentioned it. This is my first time mentioning it. Mm -hmm. But I never thought about seeing Quincy again. So years later, um, Motown was preparing to do a uh, this movie called The Wiz, mm -hmm. and uh, which with Diane Ross, myself, and Nipsey Russell, and Thorne. Barry Gordy recommended that I should play this character, so I did. So we made this film, and I enjoyed it. And, uh, and Quincy Jones happened to be the man who's doing the music. And, uh, I've heard of Quincy before when I was in Indiana as a child mm -hmm. because my father used to buy jazz albums, mm -hmm. and I knew him as a jazz musician. He came with this killer. He's this little German guy from Worms, Germany. This little white guy from Germ Worms, Germany comes with this and this whole melody in the chorus, rock with you. Wow. So when I heard that, I said, okay, I have to really work with it. So I, I, the first thing I presented was Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, and that's the one I wrote for, I wrote Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, and I think it was, um, ooh, how many did I do? I think I did three or four on off the wall. I'll think of them in a second. So every time Rod would present something, I would present something. <laughs> <laughs> but I love working like that because uh, I, I used to read about how Walt Disney used to, uh -huh. if they were working on Bambi mm -hmm. or any animated show, they'd put a deer in the middle of the floor and make the animators kind of compete right. for different styles of drawing the deer. So whoever had the most stylized effect that Walt liked, and he would pick that, and they would kind of compete. It was like a friendly thing, but it was competition because it breeds higher effort. So whenever Rod would bring something, I would bring something, he would bring something. I would always want to uh, do music that influence and inspire people, each generation. I mean, I, well, let's face it, I mean, who wants mortality? I mean, everybody yeah. wants immortality. Mm -hmm. You want what you create to live, be it in sculpture or painting or music or composition. Uh, like Michelangelo said, you know, I know the creator will go but his work survives. That is why to escape death, I attempt to bind my soul to my work. Mm. That's how I feel. I give my all when I work. Because I wanted to just live and just keep all that I have, you know? Yeah, it has to be. What I do is when I work, I, I'll do a raggedy, rough version, just mm -hmm. to hear the chorus, see how much yeah. I like the chorus. Uh -huh. If it works for me that way, when it's raggedy, then I know it's really going. That's at home. Is it? It's Janet, Randy, me. Really? Yeah. Wow. Janet and I go, who? Who? It's very important because um, we, we had a, um, Quincy calls me a nickname. It's, it's, it's not only came from because, well, Spielberg calls me that. Because, especially then, I say a couple some swear words now. Especially then, you can get me to swear. Um, so I said, that's a smelly song I mean. That's so great. You you you're engrossed in it, and so he would call me smelly. Working with Quincy is just uh, wonderful because he lets you 
experiment and do your thing, and he's genius enough to to stay out of the way of the music. And if there's an element to be added, he'll add it. Mm-hmm. And he hears these little things, like for instance, in Billy Jean, I had written, I came with this this piece of a, the bass of a bass lick and the melody and the whole composition I brought. Mm-hmm. But then from listening, he'll add a, a nice riff. Ever since I was a little kid, I used to always study composition. It was Tchaikovsky that influenced me the most, I think. And of course, Debussy, who I love very much. But I love, like, you take an album like Nutcracker Suite, every song is a killer. Every one. Mm-hmm. I said to myself, why can't there be an, a pop album or an album where every... Because people used to do albums where you would get one good song and the rest yeah. were like B-sides, yeah, yeah. or they would like <laughs> album songs. Mm-hmm. And I would always say to myself, why can't every one be like a hit song? Why can't every song be so great that people would want to buy it or you could release it as a single, you know, and everyone could be a single? So I always tried to strive for that, and that was my purpose for the next album that I did. That was the whole idea. I wanted us to be able to just put anyone out that we wanted mm-hmm. to and I worked hard for it. But it, it broke my heart, but at the same time, it put a, 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 a real, it, it lit something that was just, oh my God. It said, I mean, I was like saying to myself, you know, you know, I have to do something where they, they, it's refused to be ignored. I mean, mm-hmm. and I came with the thriller, and every time I was trying to always outdo myself, and I, Billy Jean, yeah, they said, we don't, we, we won't play it. And so, Walter Yednikov, who was president of Sony at the time, he said, okay, we're pulling strikes in. We're going to Chicago. <laughs> we're going to Chicago. Yeah. And when they played it, it set the all-time record. Yep. And they were asking for everything we had. Yeah. They said, we're pulling strikes in, we're pulling Chicago, Chicago. we're pulling Neil Diamond. Yeah. That's what Walter Yemnikov mm-hmm. said. Mm-hmm. And after they played it, it, they were knocking our door down mm-hmm. because it brought in. Then, they, then Prince came, it opened mm-hmm. the door for Prince and all the other <coughs> black artists who, because uh, they, it was 24 hour heavy metal, which is some, mm-hmm. a potpourri of crazy images. Yeah. Right. And they came to me so many times in the past and they said, Michael, if it wasn't for you, there would be no MTV. They told me that over and over personally. I was at the studio. Editing, beat it, mm-hmm. and for some kind of way, I happened to be at Motown studio doing that. Long left the company yeah. at Motown. I was in yeah, and I was there, and Susie Ikeda, who was a sweet, lovely Japanese lady who I adore. She, she, this is the lady who used to, when I was a little boy, a little boy at Motown. She mm-hmm. keep, her job was to keep my head in the microphone. I, I, I had a little Apple box with my name on it, Michael Jackson. Mm-hmm. This little Japanese lady job was to keep my head in there because I used to, I like to dance when I sing. Mm-hmm. So she kept my head in the microphone. Um, she happened to be at the studio and she asked me where I was working. I said, I'm editing this thing I just did. It was beat it. And she watched it and she said, she was catatonic. She, she mm-hmm. said, oh my God. Some kind of way she told Barry Gordy, I think something happened with that. So they were happening to do, um, getting ready to do something with the Motown mm-hmm. anniversary. Yeah. And Barry Gordy came over and he asked me, did I, did I want to do the show? And I told him no. Mm-hmm. I told him no. I said no because the, the thriller um, the, the thriller thing, uh, had, 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 we, I was building and creating um, something I was planning to do. And he said to me, what is the anniversary? I said, and this is what I said to him. I said, okay, I will do it. I said, but um, this is what I said in these very words. I said, I will do it if you, because I know it's all Motown artists and it's all Motown songs. I said, you have to let me do, I said, the only way I'll do it if you let me do one song that's not a Motown song. Mm-hmm. He said, what is it? I said, Billy Jean. Mm-hmm. He said, okay, fine. I said, I said you'll let me do mm-hmm. Billy Jean? He said, yes. I said, okay, fine. So I remember we, um, I had like two or three days or something, and I rehearsed and choreographed and dressed my brothers. I choreographed them uh, for the piece and picked the songs and the medley. Not only that, you have to work out all the camera angles and oh, I I, I direct and edit everything I do. Every shot you see is my shot. I'm not joking. Let me tell you why I have to do it that way. Um, I have five, my well, six cameras. One, two, three. Because 
When you're performing, mm -hmm. I don't care what kind of performance you give, if you don't capture it properly, the people will never see it. And usually they're, it's the most selfish medium in the world. Like the most directing and camera work is so selfish because you're filming what you want people to see, when you want them to see it, mm -hmm. how you want them to see it, what juxtaposition you want them to see it. Mm -hmm. and the to so you're creating the totality of the whole feeling of what's being presented mm -hmm. in your angles and your shots. Mm -hmm. So I, I had to set the camera, set the angles, edit it. Suzanne DePaz, no, I go mm -hmm. and I edit every angle. Michael Jackson, the King of Pop, reigns over the December cover of Ebony Magazine, ending 2007 with a thriller that's out of this world. One of the greatest albums of all time, selling an astounding 104 million copies worldwide, Ebony shut down the Brooklyn Museum and turned the Beaux Arts Court Ballroom into a backdrop fit for the King of Pop. With Thriller pumping in the background, Michael Jackson and famed photographer Matthew Ralston under the creative direction of Ebony. Try, try stuff. It's only Michael's hand. 